Wow, what a great uh, opportunity to be here, and I really mean that. My mother was dying with leukemia. In fact, she died about 30 days ago, and Bill called me probably two months ago, something like that, and said, Ronnie, God has really used your book to speak to me. Is there any way you can adjust matters relating and come? And quite honestly, there were two things that drove that decision, because looking back, it probably was uh, a challenging decision at that time because of where mom was. But my love for the lost of this nation and the world and my love for Bill Cruz. And uh, he was so strategic with us in all that we did in relationship to the Great Commission Resurgence. And Bill, I love you. I really thank God for you. You bless my heart, and your heart is so much for this region and uh, for the world. And thank you so much, and I pray for you every day. Are y'all praying for him every day? Y'all pray for him by name every day that God would show himself strong in his life. Well, Ed Stetzer uh, blessed us, didn't he? Uh, he was pretty good sick. And. Uh, <laughs> So uh, I thought, I've always heard he was sick, and so we got to see him in reality. And uh, I was supposed to go back and get the microphone, and I went up to him and said, Man, what can we do for you? He said, I'm feeling horrible. I, feel, I have a fever. I'm bad. I, I told him, I said, Y'all keep your microphone. Uh, you know, I use one of those every week. I'm right here, baby. And uh, so anyway, I didn't want that thing wrapping around me. And uh, y'all need to get that thing uh, sanitized. But I love Ed and uh, thank God for him. And, and y'all really do pray for him. He's not doing well at all. And uh, may God bless him. You know, there's a young man here that um, back in 1981, his father and I were dear friends. He ran a Baptist camp. His father was 41 years of age on his way to Corpus Christi, Texas to the Baptist General Convention of Texas, and he was killed in an automobile accident. Had four small children, his wife, Janet, and, uh, and left this young man that God miraculously called up here several years ago to serve uh, Southern Baptist, and his name is Mike Thibodeau. And I haven't seen Mike in years and years, and I don't even know. I mean, he was a little boy when his daddy died. But he let me know he was here, and it was great having time with you and Michaela this morning. God bless you, Mike, and I love you. And his daddy was one of the greatest soul winners I've ever had in any church I've ever served. The Northwest Convention, I admire all of you. I mean that. I, I have a deep passion for people who serve the Lord. Hearing the people that God has called up here, man, that is answered prayer. That is a blessing. Talking about church planting, man, that's our heart. We're, we're committed to plant uh, 50 churches in the next three years. And uh, that's what we're committed to doing, and we're on our way to making that happen. We believe in church planting. If I can help you, I want to help you, if at all possible. I probably shouldn't have said that, but I want to. That doesn't mean that I can, but I'll do my best if the Lord so leads. You know, I don't talk about this much. I should have written about it in my book. I should have talked about it in GCR a little bit more. But in the summer of 1976, I came and served in the greater Portland area. Eight to ten hours a day, myself and my brother-in-law would knock on doors telling people about Jesus Christ, doing a campus crusade for Christ survey, trying to lead them to the point of that. And through that experience, I developed an incredible heart for two things. One, the lostness of the world. And two, I knew God wanted me to be a pastor after I did that. I was already called, believed that God wanted me to do, uh, be an evangelist, you know, like we all did back then. But I really believe I went back and God really put on my heart that, yes, that's what I need to do. I served alongside of a little church plant that exploded, Bill. You don't even know the story, but the church, I, I could have forgotten the name of the church. I knew the name of the pastor. Last night, Joe picked me up at the airport and I mentioned that to him and, and he heard me talk and and I said, man, I don't remember the name of this church, but it's in Gresham, Oregon. 
And there was the guy who was driving me who he and his pastor and others combined the very church, the Greater Gresham Church, with the church that I had served, the Mount Hood Baptist Church in Gresham, Oregon. Truman Herring, pastor, also one of the greatest personal soul winners I have ever known in my life. I mean, the guy is rabid. He'll he'll tell a dog about Jesus and expect him to pray the prayer. And, uh, I mean, he, he's, he's an amazing, amazing individual. I serve in Northwest Arkansas. Um, most people don't know about Northwest Arkansas. I think it might help you if I just tell a brief story about who we are. I've been there 25 years two weeks ago. I would have never thought it. I was an arrogant young Texan that God called to Arkansas, and all of a sudden the Lord began to bless, and and uh, God began to really emerge the church and grow the church and We wake up and we're still there, and the Lord has been very, very good to us. In northwest Arkansas, we have Tyson Foods, which is right down the road from our our Springdale campus. Tyson Foods is the largest poultry and beef producer in uh, the entire world. That CEO is a member of our church, and I'm I'm using this a lot, but I mean what I'm saying here. He is one of the most fabulous laymen I've ever had in my life. He just became CEO of that company a little over a year ago. And then up the road is the home of J.B. Hunt Transport. You see J.B. Hunt trucks all over the world, uh, especially in North America, obviously. Mr. Hunt, I buried Mr. Hunt six years ago, uh, five years ago, I'm sorry, five years ago. Uh, this December, he and his, his wife are, is a dear friend of ours, and they were part of our fellowship. And that's just about four minutes from our Pinnacle Hills campus. And also just about eight minutes from our Pinnacle Hills campus is the home of this little retailer called Walmart, uh, the largest retailer in all of the world, in fact, the largest business in the world. So in the middle of all that little area up there of about 400,000 people, uh, are major national businesses. Some twelve to 1,400 of them have somebody who is there to take care of the Walmart account. I mean, one company might have two or three. The next company might have 500. I mean, it's crazy. I mean, the whole thing's crazy. But God has placed us up there. We're also the home of the University of Arkansas Razorbacks, which is just about, yes, may God bless the Razorbacks. Uh, <laughs> Um, and uh, we're, that's about five minutes from our brand new campus at Fayetteville. We're all regional churches, uh, congregations. And uh, so we're number six in the BCS. Y'all are number four in the BCS. We got any Duck fans here? Uh, number four. That's right. I fully understand. I saw it. I believe it. I know it. I love the Oregon Ducks. I really do. I love to watch them play. Last year I saw them play the National Championship game. And uh, because... One of my best friends on the planet is a guy that I discipled who is the offensive coordinator of the Auburn Tigers. And uh, so I know y'all don't curse their name, but it was a great great ball game anyway. And uh, so we were there in Phoenix and uh, saw that incredible game. Well, what I want to talk to you about today is not all that, but I, I wanted you to hear my heart, and I want to talk to you about a subject that is real dear to me. I want to talk about the forgotten vision capturing your city for Jesus Christ. I want you to get a copy of God's Word, and I want you to look with me in Acts chapter 17. Acts in the 17th chapter. I'm going to be reading from the English Standard Version, and I want to read just verse 22 through verse number 27. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. What therefore you should worship is unknown 
As this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all of the face of the earth, having determined, listen to this, allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling places, that they should seek God in the hope that they might feel their way towards him and find him, yet actually he is not far away. What a powerful, powerful scripture. Not far away from each one of us. When I was a young pastor, I heard people talk all the time about winning their city to Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, when I went to my first church as a college pastor at the First Baptist Church in Cherokee, Texas, that's right between Lano and San Saba, I believed in my heart God wanted me to win that city to Christ. I believe that. I grew up in a very small church. If we had 40 to 50 on a Sunday, we thought we had revival. I mean, it was that small, and that's what I grew up in all of my life. But there are two great things that church taught me. It taught me the inerrancy of the Word and a love for the lost. I'm telling you, pastors have incredible influence on oh, young people. But you know what? Out of those roots, I guess God taught me the the empowerment of trying to win a city to Jesus Christ. But you don't hear that conversation a lot anymore. It is rare to ever hear a pastor talk about winning his community to Jesus. Or winning his city to Christ. Or influencing his region with the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you were to line up a thousand pastors and five thousand laymen, those people that lay around, like Ed said, I wouldn't say that, but he said that. But in that, if you were to line them up and you were to ask them, what is the strategy to reach your city for Jesus Christ? Most of them would have absolutely little to say. They might spiritualize it and mumble and fumble. But they would reach far, far, far to come up with a specific strategy to reach it. You know why? Because we have forgotten that vision. We've forgotten the importance of reaching our communities for Jesus Christ. Now what's happened is is that we can really talk about reaching people overseas. But the overseas, even while it exists on our hearts and needs to always consume us, we don't need to forget our own regions, our own communities. Because the stronger we can have the gospel here, the stronger the gospel will take place across the world. Now right here in Acts 17... I want to paint for you a picture. What is going on in this passage? The Apostle Paul is ministering there in the city of Athens, Greece. It is one of the great intellectual cities in all of the world. Everywhere he went, he noticed something, and that is that idols abounded. Wherever Paul went, he taught Jesus. It did not matter whether he went to a Jewish synagogue or whether he went to the marketplace. He was a serious, serious talker about Jesus Christ. But as any of us would, he encountered several groups. He encountered the Epicureans who did not believe in their basic makeup of what they were 
that God had anything to do with the affairs of their life. And then he also encountered the Stoics, people who believed that they were self-sufficient. I think both of those groups sound very familiar in our day and affirm the reality of the book of Ecclesiastes that there is nothing new under the sun. Both groups brought the apostle to what is called the Areopagus, which was the court of justice. And there, in their midst, they talked with him. And they listened to what they called him a babbler. Paul was a gospel babbler. You could not get the gospel off of his life, and you could not get the gospel off of his lips. But with this background, we learn some matters about how the apostle attacked the region, about what we can learn in relationship to capturing the region for Jesus Christ. Now today what I want to do is that I want to give you three basic understandings of what it takes to capture your city for Christ. Now listen, let's just get honest. You may not be a note taker. That's cool. Maybe you have a great memory. Maybe you can use your iPhone or your iPad to help you. Uh, maybe you have this incredible opportunity in your heart, heart to hear and, and to remember. This isn't about Ronnie Floyd. This is not about what you think of me, this convention, or anybody else. What this is about is, what is God saying to us today? What is he saying? And I want to tell you what I believe the first critical matter is. If we're going to capture our cities for Jesus Christ. Understand your city. You have to understand your city. In verse 22 through 25, you see this. Paul told them, if you'll just look at it, he told them they were religious. He told them that they were worshiping idols. He told them that you have offered your life to what you call as unknown. But he said to them, I know this God. Paul then declared to them, he said, while you live in the land of the religious, you also live in the land of the lost. All that you are worshiping, Paul said, it's dead, and it's in vain. He said, you say you don't know this God, yet you offer to the unknown God. But let me tell you who he is. Listen to what Paul does. This God, I know him. He is creator. He is sovereign Lord of all. He is omnipresent. He is sufficient. He is the life giver. He is the life sustainer, and he is the life provider. That's what Paul said. And Paul told them this about God in so many words. That this God is so big, he could not be contained. And he was so sufficient that he had absolutely no needs at all. And I want to tell you, Pastor, this coming Sunday when you stand to preach the word... I want you to know that the same God who cannot be contained and the same God who has absolutely no needs at all, he has directed your life and called you to serve that local church and you get up there with confidence knowing in your heart that the same God who saved you and transformed you God wants to use to save and to transform your city. God is committed to the redemptive nature of all of humanity. But you know what? We live in the land of the lost. America doesn't look like it used to look like. The world does not look like it used to look like. I could talk about all of those matters in the book that you're going to be given today. 
there are a lot of sta- statistics in that book that will help you understand the lostness of the world. I, I won't go there at this moment, but I can tell you there are 233 million lost people at least in the United States. At least. I'm telling you, that's not the America I grew up in. But look at your own city. Look at your own region. You take the states of Oregon and Washington. Ten and a half million plus people. Ten and a half million plus people. Do you know what the lost index is for these two states alone? Eighty-six percent. I remember that when I was a 1976, however old I was. I was a college sophomore, about 20. I was 20 once. And I remember specifically then even someone telling me that about 90% of the people in the Northwest needed Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That's what motivated me here. And to think about the force God has already, we talk about what we need, I agree, we need hundreds and hundreds and thousands of churches in this region. I am committed to that. But think about it this way. We already have at least 138 in Oregon, at least 279 in Washington. We already have a lot of things that already are happening, and God is moving. And even the languages alone that are represented in, this, in these two states, some 128 in Oregon and some 146 in Washington. I'm telling you, the, God has brought the world to you. But you have to understand your city in order to reach your city. In our own region, I can tell you this. I can tell you that I know, and this sounds really dwarfed, but 65% plus people in our region are lost without Christ. That's in the South, folks. I also know in that region there are 66 people groups in those two counties. God so moved on my heart in the middle of GCR after understanding the real lostness of America and the world that in the middle of that process in January, I went to our staff team and I said, let me tell you something. We're going to start treating America. We're going to start treating our region like we would treat the world. We are going to learn our region. We are going to, I want to know how many people groups are in our region. Because we're going to recruit our Bible study classes to go and formulate relationships with those people group and figure out a strategy on their own to reach them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We learned through that study, we didn't know till then, we had 66 people groups. And we are in the process of seeing some of those groups engage with the gospel. Now right now we're trying to enlist 3,800 Southern Baptist churches to take on 3,800 completely unengaged, unreached people groups. Our church will do at least one of those groups. If you haven't done that yet, that's something every church can do. You say, I don't know how to do it. Nobody else does either. You're in great company. But I want to challenge you to something else even as you pray through that. What about the unreached people groups in your own region? We have to understand our region. You say, how do I find that out? Hey, get on the web. Learn about your region. The North American Mission Board and others should be able to help you understand and discern the demographic situation in your town, your community, or your city. Bottom line is this. If we are going to reach our cities, our communities, our villages, then no one needs to know what's there any more than us. The greatest missiologist, the greatest people who should know the demographics of your community ought to be you. Why is that? Well, Ronnie, I'm not, I'm not that. I'm not interested. You better get interested in it. If you're going to touch your city with the gospel, how are you going to, you got to know your city. 
You don't understand what's there. So understand your city. It's the second thing here we learn that is absolutely riveting and powerful. You have to see your city the way Jesus sees your city. Verse number 26 and verse 27 have become real jewels to me. They've always been special to God, but they have really become special to me. How do you see your city? Let's walk through this for a moment. First of all, I want you to see your city theologically. Theologically. You say, what what do you mean? Well, I want you to see your city the way God sees your city. Let me show you the way God sees it. The Scripture's clear here. Verse 26, 27. Paul tells them this. Listen to what Paul said. Hey, we all have a common creator. And that's God. That's what he says. And then Paul tells them, oh, by the way, we have a common ancestry. We all come from Adam. That's what he says. From one man. And then he begins to expose the common problem we share. Which is we're sinners. And it all began with our common daddy named Adam. And he pushes all back to the Creator and to Adam and to the fall of Adam. And then he talks, if you will notice it, he says, from one man, Adam, every what? Nation. That word nation is the word ethnos in the Greek language. It is where we get our word for ethnicity. People group. Therefore, listen to this now. This will revolutionize the way you think. All ethnicities, all races, all people groups go back to Adam. Therefore, this should automatically rule out all prejudice, all racism. Because we have a common Savior. And the common Savior is the Lord Jesus Christ, who died on a cross so that all of these people groups would have the Redeemer come into their life, save them from their sin and from perishing, and give them eternal life and purpose in this world. I don't know if you know this or not, but the ground at the cross of Jesus is always equal and is always level. we got to start seeing it, man. Some of us, you think that Jesus died only for white folks. God help you, man. Get over that. Some of you think God only died for black folks. you got to get over that. If you're Asian, some of you think that maybe God just died for the Asian people. I'm going to tell you what. I know nobody ultimately believes that in this room. But we have to go back and we have to proclaim to our churches that we have a Jesus who can unite all and can bring all. I was in California preaching at a great church about two weeks ago. And I tell you what, one of the things I love about going to California and to this part of the world is that there is such a strong representation of so many races, so many ethnicities. Listen, without Jesus, we're lost. And we must understand that when Jesus sees your city, he sees it in need of a Savior. When you go back into your city, whether you drove here, flew here, walked here, I rode a motorcycle here, or you rode your horse here. I want you, when you hit those city limit signs, to just pray in your heart and your spirit. God, from this day forward, help me to see this city theologically the way you see it. Lost or saved, one of the two. 
Also, Paul told them that you got to see your city providentially. Providentially. Notice this. This is powerful. He has determined allotted periods. This means that sovereign God, listen to this. This means that sovereign God fixed out, marked out, and designated the winds and the wares of your life. When we live, he marked it out. Listen to this. Where we live, he marked it out. He says that he also not only determined the allotted periods, but the boundaries of your dwelling place. Wow. Man, what a powerful word. What does that mean? This means that not only did God determine your race and your nationality, as well as the timeline of all history when you got to live. But notice what he says here in the text. He has also determined where you will live. He has determined your boundaries. You may not like where you are, but you are destined. (laughs) Or you may love where you are. You're destined. You see, you are a man or a woman of destiny right now where you are in your life. God is involved. You may dislike some of the people in your church, and you may not even like your church. You may be begging God, fasting, praying, running, walking, whatever. God, get me out of this mess. Okay. There may be some reality to that mess. And maybe you do need to leave ultimately. But you better understand for this season, this moment, God's got you fixed, baby. You ain't going anywhere. Until the sovereign God of heaven determines a new when and a new where in your life. We have got to understand providentially what's going on in our city. What do you mean, Ronnie? All those people are living right now in the year 2011 in your city. All of them are living within your city. Not because they decided, I think I'm going to move to Oregon. I'm going to move to Washington or I've always been here. No, God's got them here providentially. You have to also see your city the way Jesus sees it purposefully. Oh, wow, you better get ready and hold on. Verse 27, he says this. He says, oh, let me, let me, let me build it. i got to build it. Go back to 26. He tells him, he said, listen, he made from one man every ethnicity, people group of all of mankind. And he made them to come and live on the face of the earth. And in each one he allotted their periods of time when they would live in history. And he also allotted their boundaries of their dwelling place where they would live. Why? So that they should seek God in the hope that they might feel their way towards him. And by the way, Paul says he's really not that far from you. Oh, listen today. God has determined the winds and the wares of the people that live in your city at this moment of time of history for a purpose. And that purpose has to do with one major thing. Redemption. Salvation. I'm telling you, sovereign God has brought them there for you to get the gospel to them. And for you to be able to share the powerful love story of Jesus Christ for every one of them. I'm telling you, God is up to something and you need to understand that He sees them as lost or saved. He has them providentially right where He wants them so that they will come to know His Son Jesus so that they can hear at least the gospel message. And just think, he's got the winds and the wares of you there to pull it off and to do it. So if we're going to capture our city for Christ, what is it going to take? We've got to understand our city. 
We've got to see our city the way Jesus sees our city. Theologically, providentially, and purposefully. And finally today, we have to see, and we need to do this, we must invade your city strategically. You've got to invade your, strate- your city strategically. You know, Luke recorded how Paul invaded Athens. What did he say? Marketplaces and synagogues. Every city he went, he assessed them and he reached them in the most effective manner. He had a strategy to reach them, and Paul invaded those cities. That should not surprise us. What did Jesus say in Matthew 28? 18 through 20, what did he say? He talks about all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. He tells us to do what? Go and make disciples of all the nations. All the people groups. Baptizing them. Discipling them. Helping them. And notice in that great passage, it's anchored with two wonderful promises. I'm going to give you the authority to do it. And the last of verse 20 says, I'm going to be with you always while you do it. Wow. See, God's given you the authority to reach your city. And he's given you the presence of the Spirit to help you reach your city. Then we think about that wonderful passage in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. What a great passage. We could, most of us quote it. But it's a wonderful word. It's a personal dynamic. You shall receive power. Uh, there is that powerful dynamic, the power of the Holy Spirit. There is a progressive dynamic in that passage. The progressive dynamic is what? Beginning where you are? No, all at one time. The gospel's going to places all around the world, to places where the gospel has never been before. It progresses. I'll tell you one of the powerful passages is over in Romans 15, verse 20. I tell you, the Lord's really put this passage on my heart lately. What a powerful, powerful word it is. In Romans chapter 15, he says, And thus I make it my ambition, Paul said, to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. Paul said, I want to go to places where the gospel has never been heard. I, I don't mind building on somebody else's foundation, but, but, but I, I don't want to go where the gospel, where the name of Jesus has already been named. I have a question for you today. What is your specific strategy to reach your city with the gospel? Do you have one? Do you have one? Does your church know about it if you do? I'm not saying we don't have elements of that vision. I, I'm sure that every one of us do. But we need to have a formulated strategy saying, this is what we believe God wants us to do. And you do that in pencil so you can follow the Spirit and His leadership. You see, the Great Commission is telling every person in the world about Jesus Christ and making disciples of all the nations. And that's what must consume your heart and it must consume your life. I want to bring closure in this way today, and I want you to listen quickly because our time is wrapping down. How do you invade your city strategically? How do you do that? I want to give you three major words real quickly in how to invade your city strategically. First of all, I want to use the word identify. i got to get loose, man. But I want to use that word identify. What do you have to identify? Listen carefully. You got to identify all kinds of things. What are those things? If I don't kill myself here. What do you have to identify? Identify people groups. Go home and find out how many people groups, what those people groups are in your region. Identify them. We know in our region we have 66 different people groups plus a big white cluster. That comprises 75% of our population. You have to identify cultural clusters. Pockets of people who come together because they identify culturally. In our region, while we're not dominant in this area, we do have a lot of cowboys. 
And so we've established some cowboy churches. You know, I don't know why we have to do that to reach them, but, you know, we're going to reach them. I don't have to justify it. Just got to go do it. We have a strong business culture that we have a specific strategy to do what we can to have that first touch with the gospel that will hopefully end up in a lot of different cultures. And then you have to identify community distinctives. In our northwest Arkansas region, we have what we call Venderville. It's not a city, but it's those twelve to 1,400 companies that have representation that are vendors of Walmart, and they serve Walmart. We have the hog culture. I mean, we're Razorbacks, man. I mean, you know, it's, it's probably more popular than, you know, most churches. Maybe all. I just kind of hate to admit that. You know, Sunday's usually pretty good if we win. <laughs> but you have to identify. Secondly, you have to customize. Customize. I want to say this to you. You can't imitate what another church does and have the anointing of God on it. You've got to customize. You've got to customize. Christ does not minister generically. He ministers genetically. Uh, specific things you have to do to reach your own DNA. What is that? Or to reach the DNA of your community. You've got to do everything you can to customize your reach. And then that last word is intensify. Boy, I'll tell you what. Here's a real need of the culture today in the, cur- in the church culture. I can't speak about all groups. I could talk about Southern Baptists in certain places of the world. But we've lost our intensity. I mean, we've lost it. We, we, it's time for us to grow up. It's time for us to fire up. It's time for us to gear up. It's time for us to rise up. It's time for us to light it up. And it's time for us to hurry up. We act like we have all the time in the world. If someone were ask me, what is the greatest difference? In the New Testament church and the church today, one word, urgency. We have no urgency. We're too passive. We need to intensify. Now, I'm a football fanatic. I raise my boys to believe this. Jesus first, family second, church third, football fourth. (laughs) We still observe that in our household. You know, in recent Football, high school, college, and pros think they're too cool for it. But at the same time, they will adapt it sooner or later. Schools have learned the power of what we call hurry-up, no-huddle offenses. It's not about slowing the game down. It's about increasing the number of plays that you can have in a given game. 70, 80 plays. Because if it's successful, you can keep your opposition off the field to some degree. And guess what? The more time and the more options you have for to make a play means you could make more touchdowns. Duh. I mean, one of the great things about the national championship game, you had last year Auburn University, offense coordinator Gus Malzahn, known across the world of football, about creating a hurry-up, no-huddle offense. Did it as a high school coach at our school. My son was his first quarterback. He did, and he's turning college football upside down. So here Gus brings Cam Newton and the Auburn Tigers up here, and he meets another guy that his name, Chip Kelly, is all over the world of college football. What an incredible football coach. Speed, fast. I mean, everybody thought it could be 50 to 70. But defenses stopped those offenses because they stopped them every day in practice. Of their own. But baby, it's all about the pace. It's all about the pace. And it's all about the pace in your life and in your church. What's your pace? Hmm? What's the pace of your church? Man, when you go back Sunday, light it up, baby. Have some fire. Some conviction, some passion. People say, well, I'm just not very passionate. All passion means is 
It means I care deeply. I close with this. And I got to go. I do have to catch a plane. But I got a good, fast driver named Joe. I want to tell you how convinced God is and how committed God is to reaching every people group in your region with the gospel. We woke up in Springdale, Arkansas one day, and we started seeing things that we had never seen before. Now we have a large Hispanic culture in fact, it's really transformed the ministry at Springdale. It's so different than it was even 20-plus years ago. But we also woke up and we, we saw something happening with another people group. The Marshallese people. Years ago, people from the Marshall Islands needed a job. Somehow, some way started with one, but now we have the largest group of Marshallese people outside of the Marshall Islands found anywhere in North America. It's crazy. Some say 6,000, some say 8,000, all in my town. You want to know where the Marshall Islands is? Go to Honolulu and fly south four hours, baby. There's not but about 50,000 people live in the Marshall Islands. And in that ding, we started thinking, how are we going to reach them? About a year and a half ago, we started a Bible study. We started seeing Marshall League people get saved. Last November, we launched, I licensed the pastor to the ministry this past Sunday, Bill. We launched the first Marshallese Southern Baptist Church found anywhere in North America is in Springdale, Arkansas. Cross Church Marshallese. You know what? Those folks thought they came for chicken. But he brought them there for Jesus. And they're growing, reaching lost people. But the story doesn't end. The story got out last January, and the people that make the Jesus film heard about the story. And they thought about all these Marshallese people in Spring Dollars. Do we even have a Jesus film in the Marshallese language? And they discovered they didn't have it. And they have, I don't know, a couple thousand languages or more. I mean, it's amazing what that's done to reach people with the gospel. And guess what? Last, last spring, they came to our city, talked to some of our Marshallese people. They found that they were so native in their language for the first time in their history of the Jesus film, they determined to use the people that live in Springdale, Arkansas, who are so articulate in the language... To help produce the Marshallese or the Jesus film in the Marshallese language. And these new converts did it. And about two months ago, some of our team with them got on a jet, went to the Marshall Islands, and previewed in front of hundreds and hundreds of people, including all of the political people in that, in that state, in that country, the Jesus film. For the first time they heard the gospel of Christ in their own language. All started with chicken? Nah. I'm telling you, folks. God is committed to bring the last person to Jesus. Revelation 5 and Revelation 7 says, Every language, every people, every tribe, every people will be represented at the throne of God, including those in your city. You got to go get them. Because I promise you, that kind of commitment to the Great Commission, it is our last great hope.
Thank you so much for the privilege. God bless.